Shalom, praise the Lord. Welcome everyone to our study on the book of uh, Romans. Um, warm welcome to our in-person student, our online students, and also our e-learning students who will be listening to the lecture uh, later on. Um, we've completed studying chapters 1 to 8. Uh, uh, we will look at uh, chapters 9 uh, from today. Uh, before we do that, can we just pause for a word of prayer? Can I ask uh, one of you to pause for prayer, please? Anyone? Yes, Jafina. Can't hear you. Hello? Hello, Jeffina, we can't hear you. Can anyone else lead us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this time. Thank you for bringing us together in your presence. We ask that you would speak to us today, help us to learn from your word. At this time of learning, God, unite us together as a body. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. Uh, today we'll study Romans chapter 9. It's talking about God's choosing. Now, you know, Paul having, uh, the Apostle Paul having brought us to this point of uh, justification and identification and how we can overcome and live victorious lives in the midst of suffering that he was uh, speaking about in chapters uh, 7, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, it's very interesting that in chapters 9, 10 and 11, that he focuses on a totally different theme. Okay, so the previous chapters, he's talking about sin, justification, uh, our identification, how to overcome sin, how to live a victorious life in the midst of suffering. But uh, in chapters 9 to 11, he focuses on a different theme. Uh, and we know that the church at Rome, uh, there were Jews, both Jews and Gentiles. So his focus in these chapters in 9, uh, to, uh, t 9, 10, and 11 is about what God is doing with the Jews. Okay, what is God doing with the Jewish people, the, the, uh, the Jewish nation? So these are very uh, unique chapters uh, because Paul does not discuss about anything that he's discussing here, writing about, or he's mentioning here anywhere else in his epistles. There may be a verse or two which he mentions uh, in passing uh, in the other epistles or in a few epistles, but not to the uh, detail that he is uh, discussing uh, here in these chapters. So these chapters are very unique chapters. And we see that in these chapters, you know, Paul is mentioning what uh, God is doing with the, the Jews or with the Jewish people. Uh, it's very interesting how Paul presents these uh, truths to us. Um, so the question is, has God abandoned the Jews because the church now are the people whom he predestined uh, to be conformed to the image of his son? And, you know, uh, the authority, the keys of authority have been given to the church. So as God abandoned the Jewish people, the chosen people to whom he has given the, 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 the covenants, the laws, the prophets, the, the patriarchs, um, you know, everything that he has given, he had given to them. So has he abandoned uh, them? And also the other question is that arises is what uh, should be the uh, church's attitude towards the Jewish people? Okay, what should be the church's attitude towards the Jewish people? Uh, so some of the people, you know, uh, uh, some of the Jews who left Judaism, who embraced uh, Christianity, who embraced Jesus Christ, uh, they were still wondering, hey, you know, 
um, I'm following Jesus, who is a Jew and a descendant of Abraham. And we are all as Jews, uh, descendants of Abraham. Uh, we believe in Jesus as the Messiah now. We are part of the church. Uh, we are the so-called called people who are justified. But, you know, even as we are enjoying this new calling, this new identity of being justified by faith in Christ Jesus, what about uh, the other Jews who have, you know, who still following the Old Testament law, still waiting for the Messiah, who still do not believe that Jesus is the um, the Messiah uh, or is the son of uh, God. So what is God uh, doing with the Jews? Uh, and so the whole idea of, um, you know, predestination comes up again and again. We see that in this chapter as uh, well. So in verses, uh, chapters, sorry, chapters 9 to 11, um, they are pretty strong chapters in addressing uh, the whole uh, theological concept of uh, predestination uh, because God uh, chose the Jewish people ahead of time. He called Abraham. He gave them, gave him his uh, 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 blessing. He gave him the promise of blessing. He, he made the covenant through uh, Abraham and God did all this even before the church even came into um, existence. Now, since the church has come into existence, they have the promise, they, they, are, they have the covenants, they are the ones who are the called, the redeemed. Um, they are the ones to whom God is confirming the image of his son. And, you know, um, so the question is now, what about the Jews, you know? Uh, or how does the church relate to the Jews? Or uh, what happened to the plan of God? You know, he chose the Jewish nation now. The promises, the covenants are all, uh, you know, to the church. So what's the what happened to the plan of God? You know, and uh, how is God going to, you know, deal with both the Jews and the uh, church as a whole. So chapters 9 to 11, Paul is addressing what about the Jews and what is God doing uh, with uh, them, okay? Now, if you look at your notes, um, you know, it says that um, uh, chapters 9 to 11, Apostle Paul is turning his attention on God's plan for Israel. Paul also shares his own heart uh, feelings for his the people of Israel, although he recognized that he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And, um, you know, uh, even as we look at chapters 9, 10, and 11, uh, your note says, you know, we should perhaps begin at the end of chapter 11, where the apostle Paul, you know, is um, marveling at the unsearchable and the unfathomable ways of God, where he writes in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, who has known the mind of God, who has become his counselor, you know, uh, and also the depths of his riches, both of his wisdom and knowledge, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways uh, past finding out. And uh, verse 36 ends by saying, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory for ever. So we see that, you know, uh, the Apostle Paul is highlighting God's wisdom, his knowledge, which is immeasurable, unfathomable. And um, so in the light of that, you know, God's decision, and God's ways are beyond our own uh, understanding, our knowledge. And uh, so none of us can advise him. Uh, and, you know, we also get a glimpse of this in how God is working out his purposes, both with the Jews and the Gentiles, with Israel and the uh, church. Okay, so, um, and his master plan that he is unfolding is basically includes both the Jews and the Gentiles, both Israel and the uh, church. Okay, so if you look at your notes again, it says the main issue being addressed in these three chapters, which is chapters 9, 10, 11, is this that since salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus, and you know, everybody has access to it, whether it's Jews or the Gentiles you know, uh, what happens to the Jewish 
people because the Jews believe that, you know, even in the messianic banquet, there will be no Gentiles, that in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven, you know, there will be only Jews. And we know that Jesus, um, you know, uh, 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 she, uh, spoke about this uh, in the parable and, uh, you know, of the wedding banquet uh, where he says that, you know, uh, the Jews rejected it, but the Gentiles, uh, uh, you know, in the highways and the byways, people were called for the wedding banquet and they came in. That's basically uh, he was referring uh, to the uh, uh, Gentiles who will be part of the kingdom of uh, heaven. We also read about this in... Um, uh, it's in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 and 12, where it says, you know, um, and I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into darkness and there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it says, many will come means from east and west, talking about the Gentiles, but the sons of the kingdom is talking about the Jews will be thrown into outer uh, darkness. So for the Jews, you know, this was something that was totally unacceptable, something which was way beyond, uh, something that, that, you know, they never been thought of that the Gentiles would be part of the kingdom of um, heaven. So, but we see, you know, here Paul writing, uh, we get a glimpse of uh, how God is working out his purposes, both with the Jews and the Gentiles, with Israel and the uh, church and we see how the Jews are Gentiles have already also are included have access into the kingdom of God so if they have then what happens to the Jewish people you know uh, so Paul helps us to understand that while the gospel is being preached and is being received by the Gentiles you know that God has still not given up on the Jewish people. They are still part of his plan and his purpose. He is working out his plan and purposes uh, to bring them back into um, uh, his kingdom, be part of his uh, kingdom. And, uh, uh, you know, they, presently there is a remnant of Jews who have received the gospel, but there will be a time when God will move powerfully among the Jewish people to bring them back uh, into his fold to accept the gospel that is in Jesus Christ and be part of his uh, kingdom. Okay, so these uh, chapters, verses chapters 9 to 11, very unique chapters, which is not, Paul doesn't write about this anywhere else in his epistles. So we will study this in detail. And we will look at what God is doing um, with the Jews. What about the Jews? How does the church relate to the Jews? And what happened to the plan of God regarding the Jews now that he is taken into consideration the church? And how is he going to bring about, um, uh, you know, uh, bring Jews back into um, the forefront, so to say, you know, because they were always in the forefront. They always want to be in the forefront because... You know, they think they are the chosen people. They have the prophets, the laws, the, the forefathers, the covenants, everything. So what about them? So Paul is talking and addressing these three chapters um, uh, to them. So Paul is addressing what about the Jews and what God is doing with them in chapters 9 to 11. Okay. So we'll begin our study um, of um, Romans chapter 9 with this introduction. Uh, so can one of you please read verses 1 to 5, please? Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So here Paul says uh, in verse 1, I tell 
the truth in Christ, which means he says, I want to share something that is in in his very heart, you know. So he's just unburdening his heart to us. He says his heart is filled with sorrow and continual uh, grief. Okay. Um, verse 3, he says, For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the uh, flesh. So why is his heart filled with sorrow and continual grief? It is filled with sorrow and continual grief for his own people, the Jews. Uh, and this verse, verse 3 uh, shows us how much he longs for his people, uh, the Jews, to come to know uh, Christ. So literally it means, or what Paul is saying, is that he does not mind even going to hell as long as the Jews can come to uh, Jesus, okay? So look at uh, the, 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 the passion, the burden that he is carrying uh, for, the, uh, for his own people, for the uh, Jews. So he's saying, I don't mind going to hell, even if I have to go to hell, you know, it, it's totally fine as long as my people, the Jews come to Jesus. And, um, uh, you know, this is very similar to what Moses said in Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 and 32. He says, uh, you know, uh, he was willing to be blotted out from uh, God's book so that Israel could be uh, forgiven. Okay, so that is the passion and the burden that they carried for, uh, you know, their people. And so in verse 1, uh, Paul says, you know, my conscience bears witness with the Holy um, Spirit, which means his conscience bears witness and the Holy Spirit also bears witness with his uh, conscience. Uh, now, the conscience is the voice of our own spirit. Our conscience has been uh, pre-programmed by God to know what is right and what is uh, wrong, and it's the Holy and the Holy Spirit also bears a witness. Okay, uh, which means that here there are two people that are bearing witness. It's Paul's conscience, and it's also the Holy Spirit, um, and the Holy Spirit uh, Holy Spirit bears a witness by giving us, you know, uh, peace. Uh, when he wants us to do something, he wants us to engage in something, he wants us to step into something. And uh, if it is uh, a go, if it is a yes, uh, if it's something that God wants us to get into or do it, you know, then we can experience peace because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and uh, joy. So we experience peace, and that is how the Holy Spirit bears witness in our inner uh, man. But this can also be times when there's uh, restlessness, there is um, anxiety, there is, um, you know, there is just a tightening in our spirit, man. And you've learned all of this, you know, um, we also learned about this in. Um, uh, uh, in the first year in 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 um, minister ministers foundation you know how the holy spirit bears witness in our inner spirit in our inner man um there's lots of restlessness that means you know don't go ahead with this so here uh, paul is saying that his the conscience as the voice of his own spirit you know and the holy spirit also bears witness okay and it's wonderful you know when our conscience bears witness with the inner witness of the holy spirit when both of these are in agreement uh, when uh, you know my spirit or my conscience is in complete agreement with the holy spirit uh, testifying uh, jointly about something when it when this happens it brings about strong conviction there is complete assurance and uh, you know there's uh, togetherness about a matter uh, and that gives us the confidence and the encouragement the joy to just go ahead to step in to do what God is asking us uh, to do. So uh, for Paul, in this case, you know, his conscience and the con uh, and the Holy Spirit bearing witness uh, is with regard to his burden or his heart or his uh, desire for his Jew the Jewish people to come to know uh, the gospel, the truth of the gospel that is in Jesus Christ. Um, our Lord. So we can just read, when we're reading these verses, you know, verses 1, 2, and 3, we can just feel Paul's burden 
because he talks about his grief and the sorrow for his own uh, people. Okay, uh, though Paul was, uh, you know, appointed to preach to uh, the, the, the preach the gospel to the Gentiles, but we see that he still had a heart and a burden for his own people, um, the Jews. Okay, so Paul is setting up uh, things for what he is going to say. Uh, so Paul is meaning to say, hey, I'm an apostle, a born servant, a preacher to the Gentiles. At the same time, I am a Jew at heart. You know, I am born a Jew. And he's saying, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I, uh, I am an apostle to the church of Jesus Christ, but I'm also a, a, a Jew. And he says, I have a great heart for my own people. I have a great burden. I have a great desire for my people to know uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's pushing, positioning himself um, because what he's going to talk about the next three chapters is very important for the Jews and the church. And so he very rightly positions himself so that, you know, uh, the Jews who he's writing to will not misunderstand him, uh, will uh, will um, will understand what he's saying, uh, will know that he is saying this out of a burden, out of a deep desire for them, uh, for the Jews uh, uh, to know Jesus Christ and also to be part of the kingdom of God. Okay, so that is uh, verses one, two, and three. Verse four says. Who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Okay, uh, says here, the, he's talking about the, the Jews who are the chosen race, the chosen people. Talks about adoption. He says God chose the Jews or the Israelites to be his own people among the nations of the world. And because... Um, they were his own chosen people. They experienced his glory. They received the laws, the covenants, the promises, the priesthood, and also, you know, there's where the patriarchs and the, there's where the forefathers. Okay. And Paul later on, um, Paul says later on that the blessings were passed on to the Gentiles. But he's starting off from where God started. You know, God started with the Jewish people and he gave them all of this but when they rejected it you know it was passed on to the Gentiles okay verse 5 he says of those who are the fathers and from whom according to flesh Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God amen so from the Jewish people came the fathers that is the that is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David as well. And Jesus in the natural came from uh, this race as well, this nation as well, this group of people as well. So the Jews or the Israelites were so privileged as a people group. And he talks about the eternally blessed God. He calls Jesus Christ as the eternally blessed God. Or he refers to Jesus Christ as the eternally blessed blessed God. So if people, you know, ask you where in the Bible does it say Jesus is God, you know, you can show them uh, Romans chapter 9 verse 5 where he's mentioned as the eternally uh, blessed God. Okay, this is one of the places. So he is going to talk about, you know, uh, what about the Jews? What is God doing with them? Uh, why the Gentiles have been incorporated and all of those things. So before that he is you know, you know, coming to a place where he's positioning himself so that, you know, people can know that uh, he's burdened about his own people. So he's talking out of that burden, out of that grief, wanting them uh, to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he's also talking about who the Israelites were as the chosen people of uh, God. Okay. Before we move on to verses 6 to verse um, 13, anyone has any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, can somebody please read verses 6 to verse 13, please? Romans chapter 9, verse 6 to 13. 
but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Asia I have hated. Amen. Thank you, Jafida. So verse 6 says, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are all not Israel who are of Israel. So Paul is saying that God chose the nation of Israel and he spoke wonderful things to them. Now what God has spoken about them, is it a wasted or is it ineffective? You know, no, it's not wasted, it's not ineffective. Verse 7 says, Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. And so he goes on to explain. He says that not everyone who is a Jew in the natural what was what God was referring to when he made this promise uh, that, you know, um, uh, you know, that uh, nor are they all children because it's the seed of Abraham, but then Isaac, your seed shall be uh, called, which means God wasn't talking of natural people, but he was talking about the children of promise. He was not talking about natural people who would inherit the covenant or the promise, natural in the sense, you know, uh, the seed of Abraham or the seed of Isaac, but he was basically talking about the children of promise. Because the children of promise, they are the ones who are the real descendants that God was uh, speaking of. So which means it's not through the natural genealogical lineage, but it is through the promise that is um, received. Okay, so it says here... Um, in verse 8, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as the seed. Says, but the children of the promise are counted as seed. So when he says this, he's basically referring to the children of promise, and he's talking about those who inherit the promise through Jesus Christ, and that is both Jews and uh, Gentiles. So he's saying, hey, it's not that, you know, you receive the promise um, or the covenants because of your genealogical lineage in the natural, that you are descendants of Abraham or um, Isaac, but you know, it is referring to as here, it's referring to as the children of promise, which means those who receive the promise as being part of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of Jesus Christ or being, uh, you know, accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are referred to as the children of uh, promise. And this is talking about believers, both of Jews and Gentiles. And it says, at this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So God gave a promise to Abraham that Sarah will have a son. And, you know, uh, Paul is presenting this thought. And he says, not only this, but, you know, not only this, but think also about this. You know, when, when God said, the older shall serve the younger, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So he says, even before the children were born, and could have any say, you know, um, God says uh, that the older shall serve the younger, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, this is what, you know, uh, he refers to uh, in verse 11. And this is, you know, this verse 11 is a big verse. Uh, it says, for the children not yet 
being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. So, you know, God's predetermined purpose in this case, he's, he's already selected Jacob. And his selection was not based on the works, but it was according to the call of God, which means God selected according to his purpose and his calling and his choosing on the person that he has chosen or he has called. So now we look and uh, look at why God said, you know, the older shall serve the younger. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now this is in verse 13. Now, if you look at this verse 13, it seems like God has already selected and already planned ahead of time. And uh, since he's already selected and planned who will serve whom, who he will love and who he, he will hate, it means that we don't have any say in that because, you know, God has already selected, he's already planned ahead of uh, time. So to interpret the scripture, we need to interpret the scripture in the light of the rest of uh, scripture. So if you look at the, uh, uh, the rest of scripture, we, we read that uh, or we see the free will given to man, you know, right from the very beginning in Genesis, you know, God gave the free will for man to choose whether they should eat from the tree that he asked them to eat or not to eat from the tree that he asked them not to eat from okay so we were we are free moral beings we've been given the right to choose whatever we want so if we read chapters 9 to 11 we need to see it in the light of you know man's free will to uh, choose and if we don't see or read these chapters in the light of the rest of scripture or if we don't read this uh, in the light of uh, uh, of god's uh, you know uh, the freedom that he's given man or he's created us to be free moral beings to choose as we will then we will most likely you know come away with this idea that god has already decided everything you know he's pre-planned everything he's predestined everything and we are just like puppets in god's hand and god just uses us to fulfill his purposes and uh, because each one is already predetermined for something now we shouldn't read with these blinders on uh, we need to read it in the light of the rest of other scriptures that the rest of scriptures tells us that man has a free moral will to choose and god has given us the free moral will to choose so if you look at adam and eve god did not predetermine uh Adam's choice. It was Adam's choice to eat from that tree. It was Eve's choice to eat the fruit from that tree. So also, if you look at Moses, you know, uh, Moses, it was Moses' free will to choose whether to strike, speak to the rock or to strike the rock. So he struck the rock twice. And it because of he exercised his free moral will to choose, uh, which, you know, brought about his punishment that he could not enter the promised land. And we see that in, in these two cases, God did not predetermine their choices, but he foreknew their choices. He foreknew what choice they are going to make, but he did not predetermine um, their uh, choices. So even as we read, uh, uh, chapters 9 to 11, you know, we need to understand these chapters in the light of um, what I have just said, that God pre does not predetermine our choices because he's given us a free moral will to choose, but he knows ahead of time. He foreknows ahead of time what each one of us will choose. He foreknows ahead of time the choices that we are going to make. So here Paul is saying there is a purpose of God for Jacob and Esau. In God's predetermined purpose, he's already said, or in his in his foreknowledge, he's already said that the older shall serve the younger. So by stating this, you know, uh, by stating this, that he's not saying that, you know, he was not predetermining their choices. God was not predetermining uh, Jacob and Esau's choice but he's only stating ahead of time what choices they 
are going to make or what choices they will be making or what choices that they were they were going to uh, make okay so god was uh, god was equally open to both uh, jacob and esau uh, but because of their choices which he knew ahead of time he knew whom he would love he knew whom he would hate he would also know who will uh, serve whom okay so this is not god choosing whom he would love and whom he would hate but it was decided ahead of time because god already foreknew what choice jacob was going to make what choice esau was going to make because he already foreknew uh, uh, what choices they're going to make he foretells so he just foretold it but they were still free to make their own choices okay i hope you got what i'm saying in this case or in every case uh, in the Bible that we read or in our lives, God does not has not predetermined our choices. He does not make the choices for us, but He foreknows the cho the choices that foreknew the choices that we are going to make. And so here in this case, even as He foreknew the choices Jacob and Esau are going to make, He's just actually declaring it. He's foretelling it before it even happens. Okay. Now, why did God say? Yes, Paul. Paul, you have your hand up. Yes, yes. Ah, uh, for the, for the case of Jacob in Esau, I don't think it was uh, Esau's choice because when the father told him to go and hunt the animal, so that he comes and they bless him, he went. He actually went and. He, he was hunting the animal, but it was the mother who made a shortcut and fixed Jacob. So it was not the choice of Esau. That is uh, what I can comment about it, about that. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Paul. But even before the blessing was given to uh, Jacob and to Esau, you know, we know that uh, Esau sold his birthright right he came from hunting he was very hungry and uh, you know um, jacob being the crafty person that he was you know asked uh, esau to sell his birthright for a bowl of soup or stew and what does uh, esau do he has no second thoughts about it he he does not regard his birthright or you now the birthright that is held with such great um, uh, pri such a great price possession that is you know something that is valuable for a person he he treats it as something very light and very simple he just throws it away for um uh, uh, a bowl of soup so you know that was his choice that he made he's the one who gave up his uh, birthright and what followed later on was you know jacob inheriting his uh, the blessing and uh, you know it was because of esau's choice that he uh, made yes maybe even you know his uh, his mother had a part to play and all of those things but we see that why did Esau forfeit his birthright blessing. It's not because God loved Jacob more and he, he hated Esau. No, God does not hate anyone. Again, when we look at the word hate, uh, we need to look at it in the rest of scripture. Uh, scripture tells us that God is love because that is his moral fiber, his very being, is the very core of who he is. He is love. And because he is love, he cannot hate. If he hates, he, can, he ceases to be God. Uh, you know, he becomes like one among us. But God is love. There is no place for uh, hate. And so when he's saying, Esau, I have hated, in the sense he's saying that, you know, uh, I, 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 I totally detest his, uh, his choice that he made, that he considered his birthright as an invaluable thing. And something that was not worth uh, anything to him and he just sold it for a, a bowl of uh, soap okay uh, we look at it uh, look into it in much more detail we'll read about it in hebrews chapter 12 verses 15 to 17 so can somebody read hebrews chapter 12 verses 15 to 17 please hebrews 12 15 to 17 or 16 to 17 Looking 16 to 17, 
lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Amen. Amen. So you got your answer, Paul. So here he says, you know, a fornicator, a profane person. Profane means a wicked, you know, um, outrageous person like Esau, you know, who for a morsel of food, a bowl of soup, you know, sold his birthright to his brother, you know. Uh, and he says, uh, even though he regrets it, he regretted what he he had done, you know, even afterwards when he wanted to inherit his blessing, um, from his father, you know, he was rejected uh, and he found no place for repentance, though he diligently so, uh, sought it with uh, tears. So here the writer of Hebrews refers to Esau as a fornicator and a profane person. And Esau makes a, a, a mistake. You know, he was a man who was living for immediate gratification of the flesh, whereas, whereas uh, Jacob was not a perfect person. You know, he was not a perfect man. He was someone who cheated his brother. He was someone also who cheated his father. And the very word Jacob means cheater. But in spite of all his imperfections, his weaknesses, you know, he had a heart towards uh, God. You know, Esau was willing to give away everything that God had on his life just for um, a meal, just for a bowl of soup. At the same time, Jacob was not perfect, but he sought God. He wanted his blessing um, and he wanted to inherit his spiritual uh, inheritance, his spiritual blessing, the birthright. And we see he also engaged with uh, God. We read in Genesis chapter 32, verse 26, where he says, you know, uh, the, uh, God says, and, and he said, let me go for the day breaks. But, he, but Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So we see that here, you know, Jacob was somebody in his spiritual pursuit for God was so hungry. He was so desirous. He was so greedy for his uh, spiritual blessing, spiritual inheritance, spiritual uh, birthright that, um, you know, he was uh, not willing to even let go of God unless God blessed him, unless he was touched by God. So in spite of his character for flaws or weaknesses that he had, you know, this is what really touched the heart of God. Hey, that this man is somebody who is seeking spiritual blessings, seeking spiritual um, inheritance. Okay. And, um, and we see that he engaged with God till he got what he uh, wanted. So for knowing their choices well before of time, knowing what their choices would be, hence God says, you know, um, uh, that, uh, you know, he, uh, Jacob, he has loved Esau, he has hated. So God uh, says this based on foreknowledge and not on predetermining our individual choices or predetermining Jacob and Esau's individual uh, choices. Now, if we say God predetermined Esau's and Jacob's choice, then Esau would have all the rights to turn around and say, God, you pre predetermined my choice and you are you are to blame. You can't blame me. But, you know, no one can turn around and blame God because he's not predetermined our choices. But you know, and no one can point a finger at God uh, and saying that because you have predetermined and that is why I'm here. But, you know, it's uh, God cannot be blamed, but it's our choices that has got us where we are. Now, Paul goes later on to explain uh, about, you know, he, when he uses the analogy of the potter and clay and we uh, look at that in a little bit. OK, so we'll move on to verses 14 to verse 18. Anyone has any questions so far? Okay, we'll move on to verses 14 to 18, where we look at, you know, does election mean God is unrighteous? And can somebody read verses 14 to 18, please? Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, 
nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the, to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So Paul here is asking a question um, that you and I would be inclined to ask after reading all that he has written so far. Uh, you know, and the question is, is God being unjust? And so we see the style of Paul, you know, asking these rhetorical questions where he asks the questions and, uh, and he answers his, uh, and he gives the answer as well, or the answer is quite implicit in the question. Um, uh, you know, so he's asking these rhetorical questions. But here uh, he says, you know, uh, God says, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have uh, compassion. So before that, he says, what shall we say? Is, is God being unrighteous, or is there unrighteousness with God? He says, certainly not. God cannot be unrighteous and so he goes on to say you know you know God saying that I will have mercy on whomever I have mercy and I'll have compassion on whomever I will have compassion so we see that God's mercy and his compassion is extended to anyone and everyone but here we need to understand that God's mercy and compassion is not selective and partial because God is not partial you know, we, we read about this in Romans chapter 1, I think it's verse 12 or verse 16, that, you know, he's not a partial God. And we also see that God is not selective and partial in his expression of being merciful and uh, compassionate. Okay, uh, if you read Psalm 145 verses 9 and 10, it says, the Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works okay which means the lord is gracious and um, merciful and compassionate over all his works and he's good to um, all so his mercy and compassion extends to everyone but his mercy and compassion begins to work in the lives of those who receive it or those who receive him, or those who are open for his mercy and his compassion. So here, in this context, specifically in Jacob's life, you know, what happened in Jacob's life was God's grace and compassion, compassion but it was not a selective or a partial uh, case where God is being compassionate and gracious to him. And uh, like I said, we need to interpret this uh, God's mercy and compassion to Jacob in the light of other scripture. And we read in uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 16. So then it's not of him who wills, but of him who runs, uh, but of God who shows mercy. Okay. So the focus is not on the person who makes the choice of saying yes. It still has to, you know, be God who gave mercy. So here we see that Jacob made the right choice and ran with what pleased God. But we cannot say that Jacob was a hero because he wasn't a hero. It was still because God extended his mercy towards him. Okay. So what we need to understand is that God is gracious and merciful and compassionate to everyone. In this case, he is not being partial to Jacob and not uh, you know, loving uh, Esau, but because of Jacob's choice, you know, he receives God's uh, grace and mercy because of the choice he makes, because of his desire, of his hunger for spiritual inheritance, spiritual birthright, uh, spiritual blessings, and he receives it. But also, we can't say that in the end of the day that, you know, Jacob is a hero. Um, it's not that, it's still because, you know, in spite of his weaknesses in spite of his frailties in spite of what he had done wrong by cheating his brother by cheating his father god still extended his mercy uh, toward him okay so uh, when when we look at this and we can ask the question is god being unfair no he's not being unfair uh, we look at um, uh, more of uh, 
uh, the rest of the scripture to understand what Paul is basically saying in verses 17 onwards. And we look at that on uh, Friday. We'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll end class. Thank you, everyone, for joining class. Uh, have a blessed day. And a